Good evening. Thank you for waiting. We had to let allow the session next door to wrap up. If you just came in, if you want to grab a drink and get something to eat, um, we'll go ahead and start the program so we can uh, get moving. First of all, thank you for coming tonight, for attending our Heritage Night. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank uh, Don Schmiley, representing Raytheon tonight, who are our sponsors. We want to thank them for their continued support of this important event that helps us recognize some of the greatest heroes of surface warfare and honor their service and the service of so many other unsung heroes. We believe that Heritage Night is a significant event at SNA during a week of modern high-tech displays and presentations on what the future holds. It is appropriate that we review our history and the lessons learned so that today's surface warfare warriors need not relearn past mistakes or shortfalls. Tonight, we are honored to have three special guests who are going to speak to us about the Indianapolis saga and update us on the discovery of the ship in 2017 by Paul Allen. Our moderator for tonight's panel is Captain Paul Wren, who will introduce our guests and facilitate the discussion. But before he does so, I would like to introduce him. I have known Paul for most of my Navy career, and he's been one of my most trusted mentors. He is one of Surface Navy's most accomplished, respected, and recognized leader and mariner. After a tremendously successful career in the Navy and in private business, Paul has become a highly regarded motivational speaker, an active member of SNA, and an inductee in the Surface Navy Hall of Fame in 2008. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Paul X. Wren. I don't know if I can go on after that. <laughs> Good evening. And uh, welcome to our uh, Surface Navy Heritage Program. Tonight is the saga and the famous journey of the USS Indianapolis. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our speakers and uh, members of our panel after the uh, program uh, has commenced. Dr. Richard Hulver is a distinguished historian from the Navy Historical and Heritage Command. Alongside him is Ms. Blair Atchison, a marine archaeologist from the Navy Historical and Heritage Command, who was also instrumental in the finding of the uh, wreck uh, of the Indianapolis. And next to him is Captain William Toady, the former CO of the USS Indianapolis SSN 697. And a person, yes, I know it's hard. <laughs> Bill has uh, been very devoted to the uh, crew members of Indianapolis, uh, to the story, and has spent countless hours making sure that the story and the history of that ship and the circumstances surrounding it, not just for the night of the torpedoing, uh, but also the history of the ship before, which we'll touch on tonight to some degree, to tell you how it got to that point on the evening uh, of July 29th in 1945. We will hear from each panel tonight, member, who will cover key areas and insights from the ship's history, decisive moments, events leading up to the torpedoing, the sinking, the search for survivors, and then eventually the search for the ship. We'll also hear about impressions of Captain McVeigh, who he was, a little bit of his background, and so you can fully understand what might have been going through his mind on that evening. We will then have a question and answer period, and I hope we will use that opportunity to take advantage of this most knowledgeable panel. The saga of the USS Indianapolis is a tragic story full of history, decision-making, tragedy, and heroism. And I submit to all of you, it should be studied at all levels of the Navy for its lessons learned and relevance to today. It incorporates principles of command, command at sea, accountability, attention to detail, human survivability, and lastly, jurisprudence and fairness. We will trace the path of Indianapolis from its commissioning to the fateful night in 1945, principally to give you a sense of the key players and the path that took them to that moment. We will do this by describing the ship, the crew, 
and finally the commanding officer, Captain McVeigh, and give you a sense of them on that night in the Philippine Sea as they sail towards Leyte. So let me take you back in time to 1944. The United States Navy has advanced across the Pacific Ocean in more powerful and irresistible force than has ever been seen, moving from one battle to the next, island hopping, and taking back that had been lost in the early years of the war. The cost, however, has been significant. Over 700 ships have been sunk during the war, 36 alone at Okinawa, 368 damaged at Okinawa, and thousands of sailors lost. To put it all in perspective, the United States Marine Corps talks always about Guadalcanal and about the suffering that they went through and how daring and brave they were. The Marines lost 1,500 men at Guadalcanal. The United States Navy lost 6,000. The Navy's professionalism and forward progress is relentless and determined. And now the invasion of Japan looms on the horizon. However, Japan is very much a formidable force and a fanatical force to be dealt with. Although their surface Navy and carrier force have been destroyed and sent to the bottom of the sea, and the U.S. Navy has sunk over 100 submarines in 1944 in the Pacific, they are determined to defend the homeland and deploy the remaining numbers of their submarines to do just that. And so as the Battle of Okinawa comes to an end and Indianapolis, damaged from a kamikaze strike, heads to the U.S. for repairs, she is unaware of the important role she will play in the war's end and her final destiny. So let's proceed. First of all, the ship. Indianapolis was a sleek, fast, maneuverable platform who, from its commissioning, was a favorite in the fleet that sailors frequently requested orders to and frequently asked to be retoured. Built under treaty restrictions and commissioned in 1932, she was lightly armored and lightly armed, as well as lacking some of the engineering flexibility and damage control redundancy that would distinguish following cruises of her class in later years in the war. From the outset of her career, she had an elan and elegance about her, frequently selected as a flagship or a platform for the President of the United States trips, a total of three. Also flag officer journeys and state dinners. Indian Bark Franklin Roosevelt for a South American conference in Chile, having him serve as King Neptune when the ship crossed the line, and then, <laughs> and then having him sign all the new shellback cards at the completion of the event. No doubt there was high morale and teamwork. They were her mantra, and the crew uh, was affection for her and led many of the wives on the ship to say that she was that other woman in their lives. <laughs> However, Indianapolis had demonstrated her value during the early days of World War II, both in the Mediterranean and in the Pacific, earning a reputation for durability, reliability, and successful mission accomplishment. Her 10 battle stars were a testament to that. They were also a testament to her tremendous success and undoubtedly influenced Admiral Spuance in making her his flagship. As Captain McVeigh departed Okinawa for the CONUS with his damaged cruiser, Spruance encouraged him to expedite his return so he could again serve as the flagship for the invasion of Japan. Therefore, I would suggest that Indianapolis was the obvious choice for the secret mission it was soon to be selected for. The crew of Indianapolis. The crew of Indianapolis were seasoned combat veterans who knew the intensity, damage, and fear of combat. They were well aware of the importance of proficiency at combat stations, proper setting of material condition, setting damage control effectiveness. Many had been aboard since commissioning and others had requested to be retoured because of the spirit and camaraderie of ship's company. Indy was a very close-knit outfit. They had proven their ability repeatedly as they battled across the Pacific, winning 10 battle stars, as previously noted, and solid professional reputation. 
This was demonstrated significantly at Okinawa, shooting down at least seven enemy aircraft before being hit by a kamikaze, and then skillfully and courageously sprung, saving their ship after it was struck and seriously damaged. Then with pride and incredible determination, manned and the crippled engineering plan, the overworked pumps, deck stations, and reinforced straining bulkheads, and sailed across the Pacific from Guam to San Francisco for repairs without an escort. Their repeated sentiments on their crews was simply, this is our lady and the Japanese will never take it from us. The captain. Captain McVeigh. Much has been said about Captain McVeigh, so I will try to make you understand the personality and the individual that he was. Captain McVeigh was a seasoned mariner and a combat-tested officer who was steeped in the traditions and the history of the Navy. The son of a Navy Admiral, he advanced through the ranks by outstanding performance at all levels, both ashore and at sea. He was respected, and it was presumed to be on track, a fast track, to flag officer rank. McVeigh was a consummate professional and fully understood the responsibilities of command and its principles of accountability. And unlike many of his counterparts at the time, McVeigh believed in visiting his men in their workstations and their battle stations. He was one of the early members of management by walking around. His pedigree for command was certified by his performance on the light cruiser Cleveland in 1942 during the invasion of North Africa. And then later, in 1943, during the Solomon Islands campaign, where he earned a silver star for performance and personal valor. In command of Indianapolis, he had demonstrated his skill as a capable ship handler, a tactically astute commander, and a solid inspirational leader. At Iwo Jima, as well as during the bombardment of Okinawa, and then finally again following the kamikaze strike that severely damaged the ship, killing nine men and wounding 26 others. McVeigh's seamanship and skill were further solidified with his crew when he successfully sailed the battle damaged and battlefield repaired cruiser across the Pacific from Guam to San Francisco unescorted with less than half of its engineering plant intact, a four degree list the entire way, badly damaged bulkheads that were constantly leaking, no evaporators and only the fresh water that he could carry, and a max speed of nine knots, requiring water rationing and limited mess menu for 17 days with no accidents and amazingly not a single complaint from the crew. At Mare Island, he worked closely with the yard to Rod's repair officer to effect timely repairs at an accelerated rate. But although he was impressed with the efficiency, McVeigh was concerned about the, packet, the capability packages that were deferred and not installed on the ship, all to expedite his shortened scheduled departure. McVeigh was also concerned about the transfer of many, as many as 300 experienced members of his crew, many of whom were key members of gunnery stations, deck and damage control stations, and his repair teams. Accordingly, he requested refresher training in San Diego prior to departing for eventual action in the Western Pacific. The request was denied. For the Navy had a more important mission for Indy to perform. Suddenly, on July 15th, Mave was summoned to meet with Vice Admiral Purnell, the direct representative of Admiral King in Washington. He was informed that he would not be going to San Diego to train his crew. Instead, he would immediately clear his decks of scaffolding and other repairing repair materials to carry out a special cargo at max speed to Hawaii, and then, after refueling, in Tinian, on to Tinian. The contents of the special cargo would be known to no one, not even McVeigh. But he was told it was important that it was noted that this cargo could significantly shorten the war 
And should the ship be damaged or in danger of sinking, that the cargo would take priority over the lives of all the sailors on board and put it into lifeboats. On July 15th, the cargo arrived with armed guards under a cloak of secrecy. It was loaded aboard the ship, secured to the death, and two large trash can type objects welded to the floor in the Admiral's cabin. Guards were posted, and questions about what this item might be were greeted with scowls and no answer. At 0800 on July 16th, Indianapolis cast off for Hunters Point and maneuvered out past the Golden Gate Bridge. It then opened its throttles and commenced a record-setting high-speed run to Pearl Harbor, covering the 2,091 miles in 74.5 hours, a record that still stands to this day. After refueling for six hours, in which no one was allowed to leave the ship, McVeigh maneuvered Indianapolis out of the channel and away from Pearl and started heading to Tinian at 25 knots. He noted to his XO upon departing that there were no ships in Pearl Harbor. They had actually all been sortied out to give him absolutely free clearance to move alongside the refueling pier and refuel. He arrived at Tinian on the morning of the 26th where the special cargo he was carrying was removed as swiftly and convert convertly as it was delivered. During the transit, McVeigh, thinking of his future, had been drilling his crew in damage control, weapons firing, and felt that target practice at the eventual destination of Leyte Gulf would bring his crew proficiency to where he wanted them to be. On the afternoon of 26, of 26 July, McVeigh received orders to proceed to Guam for refueling and then further routing instructions to Leyte Gulf, where the ship would be given 10 days of gunnery training. His speed was limited, and yet his time of arrival was much sooner than he would have liked to have been. Dr. Holver will cover the multiple particulars of that Guam visit, the briefings he received, the preparations for the journey westward. But as Indianapolis departs, Apra Harbor on Guam on the 23rd of July, she sails into her deadly rendezvous with history. These are the tracks, that's the track from Guam to San Francisco. The green track is the one uh, back to Guam and then on towards Leyte. Indianapolis sailed out of Guam nearly 36 hours ago. The night is cloudy, visibility is low. Captain McVeigh retires to his quarters at 8 p.m. after giving orders to pick up speed. He's eager to reach Leyte by Tuesday morning for target practice. Around midnight, conditions change just for a few minutes and someone is watching from an enemy submarine. The sky does open, the moon does come out, and not far away, Commander Hashimoto of the Japanese Navy rises and spots a smudge on the horizon. And through the periscope, he gets a pretty good view of the ship that's coming towards him in such a way that it's gonna put him in a perfect firing position. Mochitsura Hashimoto has commanded submarines for three years, but he has not yet scored a kill. Now he has a chance to redeem himself. And then as the ship gets closer, he realizes there is no escort. He cannot believe his luck. Hashimoto fires several torpedoes. We know at least two hit the uh, starboard side. The first torpedo hits in the bow of the ship, allowing all the water to flood inside. The second torpedo hits the forward boiler rooms, shuts down three of the four engines. 
but the fourth engine is still turning. With that screw driving the ship forward, that was pushing even more water in and causing the flooding to accelerate. It's ingesting water by the ton. Uh, men are running around dogging hatches, which means they're sealing other men to their fate in order to save and compartmentalize the ship. It's happening very quickly. All electrical power is out. The only lights that we've got is uh, the infernos below deck. All of that water is coming in. The bow is going under. Captain McVeigh was hoping that they just needed to do the same kind of damage control that they had done in, in Okinawa and that they would survive this event as well. It only took a few minutes and a few reports from his officers to convince him, no, nah, this is very, very different and they were going down. Abandoned ship, abandoned ship, abandoned ship. You could hear, and maybe as it got closer, uh, boys are repeating, abandoned ship. When he gave that big list, I, I know the ship was going down. Then somebody hollered, Irwin, you better get off. That's when I run down the port side and dove in. And then by the time I made my way back to the fantail, she was laying over on her side. You know, the mast was already in the water. I ran down the side of the ship to the quarter deck, and that's where I went off. I was still 30, 40 feet off the water. When I hit the water, somebody hit me and drove me down. I just started swimming as fast as I could to get away from the ship. I turned around and looked, and I just saw the fantail going down with shipmates uh, still jumping off of it. There was guys still coming off, like ants on a stick, and she was straight up in the air. Everyone is looking out into maybe what is the end of life. Here, I'm praying, and I tell the Lord, I don't want to die. This warship that had lived through 10 great battles during the war is suddenly now in 12 minutes sinking in some of the deepest ocean on Earth. I looked back another few minutes later. She was gone. Good evening. First, I'd like to thank the Surface Navy Association for inviting Blair Atchison and myself to speak about Indianapolis tonight. And thank you, Captain Wren, for all the collaboration and perspective you've offered as we prepared for the evening. And it's great to have you here also, Captain Toadie. So my name is my name is Richard Halver. I'm a historian at Naval History and Heritage Command. And since the fall of 2015, I've been the lead historian working to meet a call from our director, retired Rear Admiral Sam Cox, to ensure that the Navy has an accurate history of the loss of USS Indianapolis, a history that focuses on usable lessons, and a history that properly commemorates a decorated warship and all the men who served on her. Now, Indianapolis is without a doubt, it's a very covered US Navy World War II topic. So we went into the revisit thinking there's probably not going to be no, much new ground to break. Uh, that was definitely not the case. Critical questions in the story remained unanswered, and biases against the Navy had altered historic accuracy. A Navy oral history done with Captain McVeigh shortly after his ship was lost really served as our blueprint for what needed to be done. His recollections provided a clue that helped determine the final resting place for the lost cruiser, and additionally, the burden of command that he presented in that oral history compelled us to dig deeper into his experience and the experiences of his crew. So a simple tasking turned into three years and ongoing years of work currently. It resulted in support for the ship's discovery, accountability studies for OPNAV, addressing survivors at the reunion, analysis of the wreck site, and a recent NHHC publication that tells the final chapter of the ship the cover image is up there. I was the lead author on this, A Grave Misfortune, the USS Indianapolis Tragedy. Uh, the book pulls together key documents from the ship's final mission and the aftermath of its sinking. And it gives analysis of these documents' importance. And really, our goal was to move beyond sensationalist accounts, sensationalist history, and let, let the story speak for itself. I just, uh, the hard copy is available through GPO. Um, as of last week, and I just found out this evening that you can download the free, the free download on NHHC's website, history.navy.mil. And thanks to, Paul set up the story really nicely, so my goal for this evening is to dig deeper into th 
three chronically misunderstood aspects of the sinking and aftermath, and I have three takeaways for you. Number one, the intelligence wasn't that bad. Number two, we need to stop sensationalizing the crew's experience and focus on what they went through and learn from their or ordeal. And finally, the Navy handled the McVeigh case poorly, but there's a lot that his experience can teach us about the burden of command. And when I'm through, Blair Atchison's going to, our underwater archaeologist is going to go through the wreck site and show you guys some really uh, stuff that really no one's ever seen before but us, so pretty excited about that. So we've seen the reanimation of the sinking. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to hit the high points of the sinking. So on the night of 29 July, I-58, Captain Mochitsura Hashimoto surfaced and he sighted a large vessel coming directly at him. It was perfectly silhouetted by the moon. You can see, it's hard to see here, but this is his hand-drawn sketch. Uh, here's the moon and the, and the compass and the, and the it's bright. He kept visual contact with his target for about 30 minutes. He maneuvered for an attack, armed six Type 95 torpedoes. Each had about a 1,000-pound charge. He put two of his Kaitan, his suicide torpedoes, on standby. So completely undetected, with a target of about 1,500 meters away, he fired a spread of six. All were on their way two minutes after midnight. Two of the six torpedoes hit the starboard side. The first one hit about frame seven, ripped the bow off shortly after that, almost immediately. Simultaneously, pretty much, the second one hit frame 46. Uh, they're marked on the blueprints here. Right by the internal communications room, kind of in line with the rear of the number two turret. Briefly, the entire superstructure is covered in a very violent blaze. Officers' country, sick bay, the Marines' barracks are engulfed with flames coming up from the ruptured decks below. To Captain McVeigh, the damage, the initial damage seemed a lot like what he had faced at Okinawa. He thought that his ship could be saved. That assessment changed very rapidly. Within 15 minutes, Indianapolis was, Indianapolis was on our way to the bottom of the Philippine Sea. Out of a crew of 1,195, 300 probably went down with the ship. Seven to 900 went into the water piecemeal, breaking up into seven groups, eventually many miles apart. That's an important point I'll bring up later. It's, this is not, the ship continued to move. They're coming off piecemeal. It's not one group of survivors in the water. So survivors went into the water the first minutes of 30 July, and they stayed there until they were accidentally spotted over 60 hours later on 2 August. Only 316 survived. So I'm going to focus, give you a real-time picture of the intelligence for my first point. It's become standard in Indianapolis histories that the attack happened because the Navy knowingly sent them into harm's way without an escort. That Navy intelligence officers knew exactly where Japanese sub submarines were waiting on route petty. And nothing was done, nothing was told to McVeigh because of the need to protect top secret ultra intelligence. I'll certainly agree that some criticism is needed. But in, through my research, I've discovered that this is not really the intelligence failure that it's long been thought to be. Analysts from the Joint Intelligence Center, Pacific Ocean Areas, JICPOA, they felt they had a relatively accurate picture of the Japanese submarine threat. And I'm going to show you through this slide, had they shared what they were piecing together with Captain McVeigh, really the threat level would not have changed very much. And everyone here knows intelligence, it's always evolving, it's not an exact science, and it doesn't really do us much good to look at a completed intelligence picture years later and present it as a nice package with a bow on top. That's just not the reality. So what I'm going to do now is walk you through the intelligence picture uh, kind of real time. What you're seeing here is Convoy Route Petty. Uh, it's got the points marked that the Indianapolis would have progressed, and I've went ahead and noted this is the historic Navy position for the sinking. So that's what you're seeing now. What I've just added here, the four positions, these were the potential threats that were given to Captain McVeigh in his, the intelligence portion of his Rudy instructions prior to leaving Guam on 28 July. So this is what he knew about. This is what they were going out aware of. So three of these are days old possible submarine sightings. Um, these are all the submarine sightings. These range from 22 July to 25 July, so days old. The other one is a floating palm stump. So this is what they're going out aware of. What I've just added here, the Navy was tracking, Indianapolis was not aware of this. A destroyer was attacked by a Japanese submarine, the USS Underhill. They, ran, they rammed their attacker, believed they sunk it. They were, damaged, they were damaged themselves in the attack. They had to be scuttled. But they basically thought they had neutralized the threat. If you look at it here, this is pretty far away from Petty to be a threat. This is the 24th of July, so days before Indianapolis left as well. 
But this threat, again, Indianapolis doesn't know about it, but it's a kind of a neutralized threat. So what I've just added here, Indianapolis did know about this. The day Indianapolis left Guam, the merchant ship SS Wild Hunter, the, the armed guard on that ship attacked what they thought was a Japanese submarine. And the Navy sent in a hunter-killer group led by the Albert, destroyer Albert Harris to conduct anti-submarine um, anti attacks. So Indianapolis is aware that this is going on. The officers in the wardroom are actually making a joke. We're going to be passing a Japanese submarine soon. So they're aware of this. Um, I'll say from, I'm not entirely sure that this is, from the historic record, that this is actually a Japanese submarine they're attacking. I think it might have been a false alarm. Had it been a submarine, it would have been the one that attacked Indianapolis, I-58. But uh, that, that Captain Hashimoto, he, he gave a very detailed war patrol, and he didn't talk about these counterattacks that um, you see here from the Albert Harris. So I'm not entirely convinced that this was um, I-58. But nonetheless, Indianapolis is aware of this. So what you're seeing here, this is what they go in knowing minus Underhill in the top, right, top left. So what didn't they know? Uh, here are the enemy threats that Jikpoa was, was monitoring, and this was not shared with Indianapolis. So they were aware that there were four Japanese submarines equipped with suicide torpedoes. They, they knew they had departed the Bungo Channel on 18 July to attack Allied shipping. They knew roughly where they were all were patrolling. I've got those areas circled. And this is generally, when people say it was a huge intelligence failure in the histories, this is what's presented. This information is not entirely correct, though. So as, if you remember, if you do this real time, Underhill claimed they sunk their attacker. I-53 I is in that quadrant. So if Underhill sank their attacker, that threat's essentially neutralized. More importantly, I-58, the submarine that sank Indianapolis, we were also believing it was sunk as well. So a Navy patrol plane attacked a fleet submarine as it was leaving Japanese waters on the night of 21, 22 July. And because of the type of submarine, analysts were reporting that this was I-58 that was sunk. So as early as 23 July, we're thinking I-58 is out of the picture as well. And further evidence of this, when we're actually, you look at the ultra-intelligence ultra summaries being pieced together, when I-58 sent its message that it had sank a U.S. battleship and we intercepted that, one of the analysts actually wrote in the margins, and I'm quoting him here, wait, didn't someone say I-58 was sunk? So they're completely taken off guard. How did I-58 sink something? We've been tracking her as sunk. So when you take all this together, really two of the, the two closest submarines, the Petty, they, they, we were tracking them as a, as a non-threat at this point. So really, I, it's not the intelligence failure that it's, the, that it's painted as. So let's shift gears to the crew's time in the water. It's unfortunate that if the general public knows really anything about Indianapolis, it's in the context of sharks. The Jaws monologue, Discovery Channel Shark Week, it always it coincides with the anniversary of the sinking. So sharks certainly played a role in the story. I'm not here to tell you they didn't, but their presence should not define the crew's final ordeal or the commendable service of the ship. Now, casting Indianapolis as a four-day feeding frenzy is, in my opinion, it's, it's, uh, it's a great injustice. The Navy can learn what these men went through, they can see why it happened, and they can avoid it from happening again. And additionally, sailors can draw inspiration from what the crew went through and on how the Navy actually responded when it did. So without a doubt, the majority of the 879 Indianapolis crew did not die directly from the torpedo blast or sharks. Torpedoes put them in the water, the damage prevented them from getting a distress message off, but the Navy failed to realize they were missing and they didn't launch a rescue as quickly as possible. Men died because port officials at Leyte misinterpreted Navy Instruction 10 CL 45, and they made an assumption that if the arrivals of combatants didn't need to be reported, not, neither did the non-arrivals of combatants. I'm not just indicting the rank and file here, but leadership as well. When asked how his former flagship disappeared without notice, Admiral Ray Raymond Spruance explained to prominent naval historian Samuel, Samuel Elliott Morrison, and this is a quote from Spruance about why, it, why he thought it happened, put it down to too much routine. At that time, nearly everyone felt that the end of the war was approaching rapidly. There tended to be a letdown in the interest over further war operations and a turning of our attention to what we might have to do after hostilities ceased, end quote. So in Richard Halver's words, 
Putting it bluntly here, men died of complacency and lack of attention to detail, as, as Paul brought up. Additionally, they died because life-saving equipment was inadequate. Wooden fresh water breakers let salt water in. Life rafts didn't release as they should when the ship went under. The life, ref, ra- the life vest didn't remain buoyant as long as they needed to be. The signaling mirrors that were used, they were not effective at attracting the attention of planes at the altitudes they were flying. Life rafts were dull collared You couldn't see them. Flares didn't have parachutes. These were all things Captain McVeigh brought up and worked to remedy in the aftermath of the loss. In the nearly four days adrift, the men were tested, and they did everything they could to survive. As they broke down, attacks were made on one another, misunderstandings took place over ration disbursements, and the model for who you thought might survive didn't hold up. Many of the young, many of the young and strong men with no one at home uh, simply gave up and drank salt water and died, um, or overexerted themselves and drowned. Uh, older, older family men tended to hang on longer. The largest groups of survivors were composed of over 100 men. They had nothing with them other than the supplies they went into the water with. They organized themselves around floater nets. They attached their life preservers together. And if they were lucky enough to have a raft, they would rotate time in the rafts. As they became increasingly uh, dehydrated and the severity of their injuries worsened, the death tolls increased. And deaths associated with dehydration, they're by far the most common stories from survivors. Many men suffered from hallucinations. Uh, One sailor reported that the stern of Indianapolis was just below the water and that he had swam down and entered the mess hall and drank copious amounts of milk. This led to sailors getting in a nice line and one by one swimming under to drink salt water and die. That's the type of stories that stand out in the survivors' accounts. Um, So having said all this, why, why have sharks obtained this place in the story? The ship's doctor, Lieutenant Lewis Haynes, I think answers this question for us. That's him in the wheelchair on the right with Captain McVeigh at a hospital in Guam. Haynes was in the largest group of men in the water, two to three hundred. They were called the swimmers because they literally had nothing other than what they went into the water with. Um, in, an oral history after, in a post-war oral history, Haynes said the following about sharks. I saw one shark, and the entire time I was in the water, I did not see a man attacked by a shark. However, the destroyers that picked up the bodies afterwards found a large number of those bodies. In the report I read, 56 bodies, all mutilated by fish. Maybe the sharks were satisfied with the dead. They didn't have to bite the living. The sharks certainly took lives, and their presence obviously terrified the, the men in the water that had to deal with them. But I think Haynes is right. The experiences and reports of rescue crews featured sharks very prominently. When pilot Adrian Marks made a dangerous landing in his PBY, he decided to do that mainly because he was flying over Haynes' group and saw sharks feeding on remains. Nearly all the rescue ships that were pulling in remains talked about badly mutilated bodies, many to the point of being skeletal. Crew of the USS Helm actually had to use rifles and fire at sharks to get them away from bodies before they could do their identification work. We should also remember, as I said earlier, the experiences of the water, the experiences of men differed greatly on their group. The common denominator is absolute misery, but they're in different groups. They have different supplies. Water tender second class George Stevens wasn't in Haynes' group. The Navy asked in a Navy inquiry about what had happened. He bluntly stated 17 of his group survived out of 100, 150. He attributed their deaths to many things, but very matter-of-factly, he said, quote, sharks started bothering us the third day and killed quite a few men, end quote. Another story of sharks is Captain McVeigh. He's one of the last to leave the ship. He ends up in a group of life rafts. His experience with sharks is somewhat comical, honestly, when you read his oral history. He's an avid fisherman. There's a fishing kit on one of the rafts. He keeps trying to catch bait fish to catch larger fish to feed the men with them. There's one shark that follows him around, and they know it's one shark because he's got a bleached dorsal fin, so they can identify him. Every time he throws out bait fish, this shark eats his bait fish, and he's just very upset in his oral history that he didn't have a sheath knife that he could tape to the oar and kill the shark. So very different experiences with sharks. The point being, we have to include them, but it shouldn't be the focal point of any Indianapolis history. And the other image there, that's the only image of a shark attack we have among survivors, the bandaged left hand. So switching gears to McVeigh. McVeigh's command of Indianapolis, it was an important one. It's the flagship of the Fifth Fleet. 
It's a natural trajectory for an officer on the rise. The first two years of World War II, he was the XO of the cruiser Cleveland, awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in action at the Solomons, takes command of Indy in November 44. Months later, he's participating in attacks on the islands of mainland Japan, um, participating in Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima. Damage from a kamikaze bomb and the pre-invasion bombardments of Okinawa are what placed Indianapolis on her fateful trajectory. Nine of his crew were killed in flooded compartments below decks after that attack. In his oral history, when he's talking about the loss of his ship, I think this is a very important point, he highlights Okinawa as his ship's bloodbath. That, those are his words. He talks about Okinawa being the bloodbath. That experience opened his eyes to battle damage, and he felt it opened his crew's eyes to battle damage, and it affected the way he reacted to battle damage in the, fu in, in the sinking. The damage also required his ship to go into overhaul at San Francisco, which ultimately put it in the position to be chosen to deliver the components for the uranium bomb, Little Boy. Indianapolis was at the right place at the right time. McVeigh was informed that his ship would be returning to the forward area two months ahead of schedule. That's two months rushed redeployment. This placed him in a situation where he needed to take calculated risks. In the three months he was at Mare Island, the makeup of his crew changed dramatically. About 25% of the crew mostly were new assignments. They'd never straight out of boot camp. The need to train up untried men before returning to the forward area weighed very heavily on his mind. And at every step of the way, when he tried to get training, he was told, it's not here, it's there. You're not going to get your training until you get your sh ship safely to the Philippines. His decision on routing that put him in the path of I-58 was based on the desire to arrive in the pre-dawn hours, best lighting to do anti-aircraft gunnery practice. He inevitably lost time in that Guam Leyte transit during the daylight because of zigzagging. Navy tactical doctrine granted him the discretion to not zigzag at night if visibility was poor enough for him to feel comfortable seizing the defensive maneuver, which he did. Visibility improved shortly after zigzagging seized. The officers of the deck did not resume. His ship was sunk at close range by an enemy submarine that maintained visual contact for over 30 minutes. In hindsight, zigzagging would have been prudent, albeit insufficient to change the outcome in this case. Captain of the Naval Service is responsible for the safety of their ship. This is an absolute. Captain McVeigh understood the scrutiny that would come his way. He reflected in that oral history that he probably would have been better off to have gone down with his ship, to have died. But something compelled him to live. He couldn't quite put his finger on what it was. He continued to captain the men in his life raft. These were the only crew he thought were left because they were drifted so far away from the others because they were all in rafts. He reported immediately to rescuers that he wasn't zigzagging, and throughout investigations, he did not shirk the responsibility of command. I'd like to use this image here. This is the, on, on the left, that's the dispatch from the, the Ringness, the ship that picked up McVeigh, and you could see, these are his words. He felt compelled to tell his rescuers to pass on to sink pack, speed 17, not zigzagging. He's admitting to not zigzagging from the very beginning. CNO Ernest King's decision to court-martial Captain McVeigh and McVeigh's conviction on a very technical charge was legally sound, even though it went against the recommendation of the leadership directly in his chain of command, Nimitz and Spruance. The situation was handled improperly from a moral and public relations standpoint. No attempt was made by the Navy to articulate the reasoning for the court-martial, nor the conviction or remittance of the sentence. That's an important point that's often overlooked. McVeigh was convicted for hazarding his ship. That's in his file. Um, but immediately after the conviction, the court unanimously decided to remit the sentence. So technically, although being convicted of hazarding your ship, his, the trajectory of his career is effectively over, but he really suffered no damages. He didn't lose any points. Um, he stayed in the service. He retired as a rear admiral. But if that, really, he had no grounds for appeal going forward because there was nothing, nothing to appeal. No damages were brought. He, he had suffered no damages. And it's my impression that the timing of the loss was McVeigh's downfall here. Uh, he was the only captain in the war court-martialed for losing his ship in enemy action, but he lost his ship at the very end of the war. Censorship had lifted. The public was aware of the loss. It was announced the same day as uh, the announcement of, of victory over Japan. The Navy had to do something about the loss. McVeigh was ha court martialed convicted for hazarding his ship, but not for losing it. 
The Navy's treatment of McVeigh is important to talk about and understand, and McVeigh's character should be commended. That would be my point from this, this final portion. It's not for us to speculate what led him to end his life in 1968, but if you view the stack of condolence letters that he had to sign, 879 condolence letters, he signed all of them. You go to the archives, you can look at these. This is L through Z. This is just one part of it. This is onion paper. If you put them all together, this is over eight inches tall. You know, no matter what happened to him in the court martial, this is his punishment. This is the burden that he had to face for the rest of his life. And this correspondence with families, it didn't end with him signing this letter. Many of them wanted answers, and they wanted answers from him. Some placed the loss entirely on him, and they were very negative letters. Others were more sympathetic. I'd like to end my remarks here with an uh, excerpt from a letter that I shared with the survivors at the reunion this summer. Um, the words I'm going to share with you are from Mrs. May Fleshman. She's the mother of lost seaman Vern Fleshman. She wrote this on September 30th, 1945, so just a little over, just about two months after the loss. And this is what she wrote to McVeigh. Our boy was baptized in the Bethany Baptist Church in Kansas City, Missouri. Well, and on his last visit, and you may realize how I feel about that, he was saved by the water. Just a boy, but he died like a man. And Captain McVeigh, all you and I can do is watch and pray, for we never know who's next, do we? Christ said he would come again, and he will. The dead shall rise from the sea also. I hope that your next assignment will sail under a luckier star, or may we say, a more peaceful ocean. Thanks. Hi. My name is Bill Toady. I was the captain of the submarine in Indianapolis, and um, it's been my honor to know the survivors of that um, so, of the cruiser uh, for almost 25 years. Uh, Dr. Halver has become a good friend. I want to say to begin that for after decades of neglect of this story by the Navy History and Heritage Command, what, what um, Admiral Sam Cox and Dr. Halver and the entire NHH team have done over these past few years is remarkable and I can't tell you how grateful I am that they have, and the survivors are, that they have invested so much time and energy to the story and in covering the truth, because the truth is, for decades, to the United States Navy, this story was radioactive. Nobody wanted to touch it. And that has changed, and I can't tell you how grateful. I will also say that Dr. Halver and the NHH team have done a remarkable job in uncovering the facts of the story. And I believe the facts are indisputable. But what I'm going to tell you is that I disagree vehemently with some of the conclusions derived from those facts. And I'll get to that in a moment. But I want to start by saying that having served two tours on the submarine in Indianapolis prior to my command tour, I served as a division officer and a department head. By the time I got to command, I thought I knew the story, and I, and I, I kind of did. What changed when I got to command was not only did I get an opportunity to learn more about the story, but I got to learn a lot about the people, the crew of the cruiser in Indianapolis, and what a remarkable crew that was. You know. Um, in 1998, they asked me for, their, for my help in helping their captain get exonerated. And, and frankly, I, inwardly, I rolled my eyes. First of all, I was thinking, there's no win in this for me. No matter which way it turns out, either I'm going to disappoint the survivors or I'm going to piss off the Navy. There's no, there's no good outcome of this, right? But I felt a moral obligation to, to do what I could and try to see if there was some aspect of the story that had not yet been revealed. And, you know, going back, thinking about the fact that they spent nearly five days in the water before they were rescued, watching their friends die. Early on, most of them were injured from the torpedo attack itself. Those died within the first 
eight, ten hours. And then after that, over the course of days, of course, very hardy sailors and Marines um, died over the course of time until, as Dr. Halver said, only 316 were alive at the point that, um, where they were picked up. It's just absolutely unfathomable to me that you could go through that experience and, and survive. And, and then, of course, as Dr. Halver reported, after they were rescued, their captain was court-martialed. And for decades, the Navy said he wasn't court-martialed for the sinking. He was court-martialed for hazarding his ship by failing to zigzag. I'll get to that in a moment. But think of this through the eyes of the survivors. Think about this from their perspective. We spent nearly five days in the water because of the incompetence of the people who should have recognized we were missing. And now you're going to blame us for the sinking? Think of the psychological aspect of that. And think of what you're saying to sailors everywhere when you do something like that. For many years after the sinking, those sailors lived with what we have a name for now that we didn't have a name for then. PTSD. More than half of them became alcoholics. More than a dozen committed suicide, including the captain himself. And they just did what people do after World War II, the greatest generation. They were stoic. They went home, they tried to get on with their lives, and they tried to forget about it. But they couldn't forget about it. It lived with them every day. Until 1958, when a group of them, led by a Marine, I, <laughs> I, I point out, decided they, they were going to get together and have a reunion in 1960 on the 50, 15th anniversary of their sinking. Kind of odd. And that they would invite Captain McVeigh to speak. So they did. They sent a letter to Captain McVeigh. He didn't want to come. He had sent those 879 personally signed letters of condolences, all typed up by Yeoman First Class Victor Bucket, who I got to know later in life. And um, he had no idea how he would be received. What he did know was the correspondence he did receive were mostly from Lost at Sea families, and they were very ugly. Sailors who didn't survive. After all, the Navy, his very, his own, very own Navy, seemed to blame him for the fate that those sailors suffered. Why should they think different? So they blamed him. But they begged him to come, and he decided he would. That was in 1960. And I would say that, you know, in my estimation, those years of anguish and torment, 15 years between 45 and 60, turned from torment to rage. As those sailors thought about what they had gone through, the suffering they endured that was not necessary, and the suffering their captain was clearly still enduring 15 years later, feeling guilt for all of those deaths. And so, you know, I thought about all that when I decide, was trying to decide whether or not I would take part in this uh, effort to exonerate Captain McVeigh, and, and I decided to do it. And, what I thought I knew about that incident turned out to be almost all wrong. That was the incredible thing. And many of these things that you, know, that you think about kind of vaguely, when you start really internalizing them as naval officers, they look very different to you. I mean, who in their mind would draw a straight line between Guam and Leyte and route all their ships down that track. Much is made of the fact that these areas of uncertainty for the Imperial Japanese Navy submarines were a thousand miles wide. And that might be true, unless you commit what I consider a mortal sin of intelligence, which is failing to think like your enemy. Right? We've all been given submarine datums with ridiculously large area of uncertainty. And as a submarine captain, I can tell you 
mostly surface officers in the room, I, here's the secret. Think like you're the submarine. Where would you be if you were him? And I, I submit to you that it won't take much thought to figure out the answer. And if the intelligence folks had given 20 seconds of consideration, 20 seconds of consideration, where would I be if I were the I-58? Oh, on that straight line between Guam and Leyte, exactly where he was. But nobody bothered to do that. So don't tell me there was a thousand mile area of uncertainty. That's nonsense. There was a 10 mile area of uncertainty if you had given it any thought, which they did not do. Then you get to the issue of, you know, he wasn't court-martialed for failing the zigzag, or for, for sinking the ship, he was court-martialed for hazard. Let me tell you, the survivors never bought into that, never, <laughs> as you would expect, right? Question asked, would you have court-martialed him if he failed the zigzag, but he made it to Guam on time? Of course not, okay? And in fact, as if God was helping us with this solution, in 2017, the son of the prosecutor in the court-martial gave us a call and said, you know, I still have my dad's notes from the court-martial. <laughs> Do you think anybody would like to see these things? <laughs> he lives in Alexandria, and I live in, live in Leesburg. So I, that day, within like two hours of getting the call, drove to Alexandria, and he was kind enough to welcome me into his home and open the file. Proof point number one, <laughs> the ship was sunk because it failed to zigzag in the evidence that needed to be provided in the court-martial. And then lines of proof points all the way to Captain McVeigh is guilty for the ship sinking. So the prosecutor's own notes revealed that was a lie. And it was a lie that the Navy perpetrated. No, it was a falsehood, because I don't believe that people intentionally said these things. I believe they just didn't know. And, and there was a, an official line prescribed for everybody to use, and for over 70 years, that official line was all the Navy ever produced. And that's a travesty. This, so this entire story from beginning to end is a travesty. So I was help, happy to help the survivors in their journey of discovery. Um, I tried my best as the captain of US, another USS Indianapolis. Actually, I was the 10th and final captain of the submarine Indianapolis. McVeigh was the 10th and final captain of the cruiser. And as I heard those words, you, know, you ring the bell when you walk aboard your ship every day, ding, 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 Indianapolis arriving. As I heard those words, every day I thought of him, trying to get into his head. The survivors fought for nearly five days in the water. They fought for over 50 years to get their captain exonerated. It finally happened in the year 2000, and it took too long. But throughout all of that, throughout all of that, from their time in the water to their fight to get their captain exonerated, to their fight to get their ship recognized in other ways, they had a motto. And that motto is, never give up. And it's a wonderful motto. Went to visit with the crew of the little combat ship LCS-17 last week, and telling with three of the survivors. And um, Paul was there as well. And as the survivors are telling the never give up story, then and there, the LCS-17 crew declares, that is our motto. And what a wonderful moment that was to have the World War II veterans, I was the only submarine in Indianapolis per person present, and, but the, the crew of the LCS present. And what a wonderful moment that was. And what a wonderful crew that was. For those guys to fight for over 50 years to get their captain exonerated, there was nothing but fight in that crew. 
Isn't that a crew every one of us would have been proud to have on our ships? Just, it's, it you know, really gets to you. I was proud to know almost 200 of them. There are 14 today. And there's just a remarkable group of men, and I don't want us to forget their story. You know, as far as Captain McVeigh goes, as Dr. Hover reported, the first message sent from the Ringness, the ship that rescued him, he freely admitted he was not zigzagging. Again, he admitted everything. The court-martial never complained, never said one word, never fought. Said, I was the captain, I was responsible for its fate. Again, stoic. But when the crew asked me to help with the exoneration, I said, well, you know, they must have demonstrated something with respect to the effectiveness of zigzag in World War II. I'll tell you, as a fast attack skipper, I was never worried about zigzagging. I, of course, that's with acoustic homing torpedoes, right? One shot, one hit, every time. What about World War II? How would that have worked? So what I did was I decided to go back to Commander Hashimoto's own narrative in a book he wrote called Sunk, where he talks about the sinking of Indianapolis and reconstruct the attack. Something I could actually do on my uh, submarine fire control system by turning my ADCAP torpedoes into straight running, non-homing torpedoes, and then firing a Salvo 6, just like Hashimoto did, then running various zigzag scenarios. I couldn't find a scenario where at least one of those torpedoes didn't hit. Unfortunately, this is not something they did in McVeigh's own, own court-martial. If, if the tactic doesn't work, then how does failing to use the tactic hazard the ship? So again, if only you ask yourself the question, I knew McVeigh's sons, I tried my best to get inside his head how he would have reacted. I'm not sure he would have reacted any differently, even if, even if that kind of reconstruction had happened in his defense during the court-martial. I think he would have just said, somebody needs to take the, the hit. I'll be that somebody. And just like the crew, I said, what a remarkable crew. Wouldn't all of us be proud to have that crew on our ship? What a remarkable captain. Wouldn't all of us be proud to have a man like that commanding one of our ships? Thank you very much. Howdy. By the way, y'all feel free to go get a drink. I'd rather have a happy crowd than a bored crowd. <laughs> so, uh, I'm from Texas, if you haven't figured it out. So I'm Blair Atchison. I'm with the Naval History and Heritage Command Underwater Archaeology Branch. So Indianapolis discovered. What's next? It's not just about finding the ship for us. So NHHC is responsible for the management, study, and protection of 17,000 plus US Navy ship and aircraft wrecks located worldwide. So Dr. Holver and I have started a side-by-side -side archeological and historical review of the wreck site data provided by Paul Allen's research team. So I have a lot of data to go through, so forgive me for reading. The story of Indianapolis is not an entirely positive one for the Navy. But as the Navy's institutional memory, it is NHHC's responsibility to tell it so that the lessons of the past are not forgotten, can be used to enhance the warfighting effectiveness of today's Navy, and to honor the sacrifice of the American sailor. In 2016, the director of NHHC, retired Admiral Sam Cox, stood up a team of historians, archivists, public affairs officers, and archaeologists to ensure an accurate history and primary source documents were readily available to the Navy and the public. UA, Underwater Archaeology Branch and Histories Branch, along with assistance from the U.S. Naval Academy, was specifically tasked to revisit the sinking. Dr. Holver was able to identify a previously unknown LST that was the last friendly vessel to see Indianapolis on 29 July at 1300. In less than 12 hours, Indianapolis would be at the bottom of the sea. The coordinates from LST 779 was a key piece of information for the drift modeling UA and the US Naval Academy were conducting. The results indicated that Indianapolis was not exactly on the routing track as historically believed, which is not surprising as captains of combatant ships could deviate up to 40 miles from the planned route. 
NHHC then proposed a 10 nautical mile survey area, approximately 35 nautical miles to the southeast of the Navy's 1945 location. This information was made available to anyone in the public that asked. One of those groups happened to be Paul Allen's research team at Vulcan aboard the RV Petrel. <clears throat> Independently of NHHC, but with the information on the LST found by Dr. Holver, Vulcan developed their own survey area and located the wreck on August 19th, 2017. The wreck was only six nautical miles outside the Navy's proposed new search area. Over the next year, Vulcan had a string of major World War II U.S. Navy shipwreck discoveries, including Juno, Ward, and Lexington, and we know they're continuing their search. Vulcan has been forthcoming, cooperative, and responsible in their approach to locating World War II shipwrecks and desires to get the data to the responsible government agency. In the case of U.S. Navy, that is our office. So the Vulcan team is professional and clearly very good at what they do. Sometimes I wish they'd slow down a little so we could catch up. But their goal is identification only, not archaeological documentation or analysis. That's where we come in. Because the site was not systematically documented, the data review and analysis is taking a bit longer than expected, so these are just our preliminary findings. So Dr. Holver indicated five main questions from the historical narrative that the data might be able to answer. One, does the wreckage get any indication of the ship's movements after the hit? So, little site orientation here. And you can turn down the lights on me, it might show up better. So we have the bow, that little guy. And then we have the main hull wreckage down here. And that is 1.95 kilometers apart. So we know the ship was moving at 17 knots. Um, condition yoke modified, meaning the watertight doors and portholes were open for the comfort of the crew. Since we neither have the time or the money right now, I brought my own model compared to the PBS version. So, <clears throat> bear with me for a second. So this is the right orientation, she's traveling, head at the bow, first one on starboard, rips the bow, rips the keel, and the bow goes back to the port. She starts going down, bow comes off. Second hit just forward of the bridge, and now she's going down at the bow and has a starboard list. Now the, the second hit severed all communications to the engine room. So as we heard before, the engine room decided to keep going, trying to escape the enemy, not realizing this is pushing more and more water into the bow. It's also causing the ship to have, um, to circle to port as well. So she's going out the head, She's listening to starboard and circling to port, eventually almost capsizes before going vertical and sinking 3.5 miles down. And that is exactly what we're seeing here. So here, right in here is where the ship, we believe the ship capsized, right about here. Um, in the right orientation, we have mostly forward debris, bridge, guns, then the hangar and aircraft debris at the back. And so you can see she made a turn to port right there. So I already answered the question, was the bow severed? Yes. A charge of 452 pounds could easily blow off a small portion of the bow of a cruiser. USS Minia Minneapolis, pictured here, lost her bow, but they saved the ship. So the bow of Indy is lying on her starboard side. So right here you're looking, you're looking directly forward. She's lying on her starboard. Um, you have the capstan, anchor, and anchor chain uh, are all still in place. So meet Seaman First Class Pino was standing on watch on the 20 millimeter guns. The blast threw him in the air, but after collecting him himself, he saw that the bow was gone forward of frame 10. And that right there is frame 10. A bright flash witness on either side of the bow just after the initial expo explosion was likely the aviation gas tank rupturing and possibly the force that pushed the whole bow back to port. It remained momentarily connected by hull plating before detaching completely and sinking. There were four sailors sleeping on the forward section and were the first lives lost of the night. So now we have, you're looking at the port side, anchor, 
that says Norfolk Navy Yard. So that was helpful. And then right behind that, we have the 35, which is when uh, Vulcan knew they had found it. And you're starting to see some of the torpedo damage right there. So next question, how many torpedo hits did I-58 score on Indianapolis? Two or three, and is there any evidence that a chitin, a manned torpedo, was used? I-58, as we heard, launched six torpedoes. The submarine captain said he had the chitons prepared, but knew the ship was his, so it would be a waste. He says he heard four hits, then up to 10 additional explosions while the ship was sinking. The data confirms the survivor reports of two hits, one at the bow, around frames six and seven at the waterline on the first platform. So it's hard to see in this picture, but the keel is right here, it snapped. You have torpedo damage blowing out on the port side, and the 35 we were looking at earlier was right here. And what you don't see is about eight frames of hull plating just sticking 90 degrees up, and that's where it, it last was attached to the ship. So the second hit struck in the vicinity, vicinity of frame 45, slightly below first platform level. The damage from the second hit was more widespread and undoubtedly killed numerous crew. There's no evidence of another torpedo hit in this data set, and we also can't determine if a chitin was used based off of this. So now you see the ROV is going up the hole. The last question, did the magazine explode? The red is recorded damage from survivor accounts uh, directly above the impact area were, were crew spaces on the first platform, sick bay and marine compartments on the second deck, and officer's country on the main deck. Survivors reported ruptured decks with flames coming through, scorching hot walls and floors that burn hands and feet. And we know this is likely a chemical reaction, and our lab is trying to figure out what caused it to burn so hot, so fast, so instantly. So you saw in the previous video, there's not a lot of damage or severe bulking in the hole plating, what we would expect to see if the eight inch magazine exploded. It is possible that the five inch ammo storage area exploded. Granted, we can't see the full extent of the damage because of the sediment. The only outer damage visible is on the communications deck at frame 44. This is right about here on the ship. So this is shooting out of the deck. We believe that the explosion hit the lateral bulkhead, went up through the eight inch hoist, and then out through the deck right here. There's another view of it. So it's right. There's the damage. The wreckage confirms that the Navy's initial investigation taken from survivor accounts and battle damage reports was remarkably accurate for not having the data that we have. Now for just some site observations. Note here, kind of what it looks like. So this is forward, stern. Here kind of looks like pinchers, I guess, is the best way you can describe it. It's actually the whole plating just being pulled back like the top of a tin can. This damage is from the sheer force of the waters it was sinking. Preliminarily, we calculated it took about 20 minutes from when it first went under to crash into the seafloor. And the crater is, is huge. We have, um, I should say it's 124 meters wide, not deep. One of the first interesting, interesting things we noticed was a completely missing section of the ship, roughly 12 frames between the bow and the main hull section. Several survivors escaped through frame, the hatch at frame 17 right here. So we know that it was attached during the initial sinking, but then it's gone in the video. The survivors mentioned that the deck was cracking in the section after the hits. We believe this area was weakened by both the explosions and then the pressure of the water during its rapid 3.5 mile descent caused it to come apart. There are some random sections of hole plating in the debris field and one large chunk that could be from the missing section, but what has been found so far would not equal 12 frames. So this, we believe, might be part of that section, but we're not sure. So here's some interesting video of the forward part of the main wreckage. We're looking roughly at frame 23, forward of the number one turret, port side. 
You see how the whole plating is peeling away by the force of the water, but you can also see the amazing preservation with the teak wood and the two-tone gray paint. And um, I've looked at a lot of shipwrecks and we just don't get this kind of preservation. So the stern is interesting because it's badly damaged, but we know it wasn't by a torpedo hit. Based on witness accounts, this is where most of the crew entered the water and not a single survivor spoke of damage in this area. So here, these are the quad 44s and the sides. So this one's you're looking aft, this one's you're looking forward, and it's just buckled into, and the whole main deck has collapsed. So this is looking back. You have the th number three mount, which is amazingly still in place. They usually fall out. Um, and then the main deck has collapsed right here. Some video. So in discussions with naval engineers, we believe this, this is a combination of implosion damage, as the crew did have time to dog the hatches and impact with the seafloor. So it's hard to see, but it's just, the main deck is broken there and it's buckled all along the sides. So the forward and aft tripod masts have broken off the main hull and are in the debris field. They likely broke when the ship capsized based on the surrounding debris. The forward tripod detached and has fallen forward into the sediment. So right here, we're looking at the back side. The forward fire control, navigation bridge, signal bridge, and most of the communication platform are all still together. The forward antenna mast has fallen backwards, so up here, this is falling backwards, and it's right there, laying on top of the bridge, right next to the ship's bell. So the guns. As far as the guns, the number one and number two triple eight inch 55 cal mounts fell out when the ship capsized, but are in the debris field, and they're buried, both of them are buried barrel first. Uh, one of the questions Richard and I have been trying to figure out is which one is which, and we haven't been able to figure it out. But we, we do have both the one and two. Interestingly enough, all of the five inch guns are in place in the main records, except for the number two, it's missing. And our, my current theory right now is that the catapult took it out when it was being forced backwards, because we found the catapult resting back here along the ship. So all the quad 44s are in place, but all the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns are gone and we haven't been able to lo locate them in the debris field. So these are parts of the SC2 Seahawk for all my aircraft enthusiasts out there, um, including we have fuselage, tire, and pontoon. So much of the debris field though looks like this with smaller debris everywhere and parts of ship that are hard to identify. Um, right here though, we were able to identify uh, gas masks. So it is important to note that for, from our perspective, the debris field is just as important and protected by law um, as the main wreckage and should not be overlooked for the story it has to tell. But for most, most people, the search and discovery of a shipwreck is much more exciting than these often painstakingly slow documentation and analysis of a wreck site. But that is what they hire archeologists for. The status. Indianapolis is a sunken military craft under the jurisdiction of the Department of the Navy and falls under NHHC management. The site is a fit and final resting place for nearly 300 sailors and a memorial for over 800 sailors lost at sea. It is incredibly well preserved and we have such a unique opportunity to both study and protect this site. So for the future, some of our goals besides finishing the data review is to draw a site plan to the extent that the video allows. So right here we have so far kind of an annotated ship plan with a combination of my notes and Dr. Holver's notes. We will develop a management plan like we do for all of our rec sites and hopefully work with the Naval Surface Warfare Center to do some flood modeling and analyzing the damage sustained during the descent to the bottom. So in receiving terabytes of video data from third-party researchers that are not archaeologists has brought our attention 
the need to develop an ROV best practices or guidelines for non-intrusive data collection on these deep water sites. So it'll help us be able to collect data and review it faster. So like space, the deep ocean is not just for governments and academia anymore. There's an ever increasing interest in deep water shipwreck tourism, from the serious privately funded researcher to the billionaires with submersibles that want to see cool stuff. But we are already discussing policies to address this trend and how best to protect the US Navy's sunken military craft like Indianapolis. So thank you. Uh, before we end tonight's program, I'd like to, uh, I have a couple of questions that were passed to me before this evening. Some of them have already been answered. Uh, I'd like to ask if anybody has a, um, a question to ask this panel uh, about this event and the events following it. Yes, sir. You want to answer that? We good? All right. So uh, let the historian answer in a second. I will say that Admiral Nimitz and Admiral um, Spruance both recommended against court martial. And it was in commonly thought that it's Admiral King who overturned that recommendation. Actually, he didn't have the authority to do that. The Secretary of the Navy overturned the recommendation and directed that it proceed to a court martial. Over the years, uh, a lot of speculation has been made about King's animus towards Captain McVeigh's father, or a whole bunch of uh, concepts have been forwarded by different authors about why King did this. First of all, he didn't do it. Now, granted, Spruance probably acted on King's recommendation, but it, you know, it's, it's all speculation. Yeah, Dr. Hover? Yeah, no, I, I agree totally with that. Um, it's, it often gets blamed entirely on King, but it, it did ultimately fall to Forrestal. And uh, if anything, if, the main critique for King possibly in the whole thing is that he sort of rushed the court martial before the Navy Inspector General had a chance to finish their report. Um, that would be, that, that's kind of the biggest thing I think that, that uh, King did. He speeded up the court martial. As, and as recent discoveries have proven, the Inspector General was um, unveiling a bunch of exculpatory evidence that would have tended to um, weigh in McVeigh's favor. And of course that leads to more speculation about they wanted to rush McVeigh to court martial before the IG cleared him. The timing is actually that, that they did rush to court martial before the IG cleared him. The, the reasons for doing that are still unclear. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, uh, you know, the, the situation was, uh, everybody asks, you know, why were they in, in conditioned yoke? Well, they didn't have air conditioning on those ships, and they were unbearable down below main decks. In fact, many of the survivors were up on the main deck, sleeping under the guns and all, all over the ship. I, I think in that, in that situation, it was a modified yoke condition. A ship like that could go to general quarters and set zebra in less than three minutes if they were really well drilled and trained. Uh, from our experience, we, we achieved that in the U.S. Navy today, going from a modified Zebra configuration in less than three minutes, frequently. So, did it contribute to the progressive flooding throughout the ship? Well, undoubtedly, it, it probably did. Even if, the, even if the repair parties reacted rapidly, think of the size of the damage on the ship and the amount of free service that that ship faced as it was moving forward. I think the greatest contributor to the sinking of the ship is the fact that that after engine room the engine order telegraphs did not work. At the explosion, they still showed that the ship, that the captain wanted 17 knots. He was unable to tell anybody to stop. So the, the forward engine room was destroyed. The after engine room saw that the speed was going down, 
and increased the, increased the flow of steam across the turbine to maintain that speed and kept driving the ship. So they went almost, almost three miles, or a mile and three quarters, or you know, some, some large distance before they went down, which I think you know, created the force that flooded the ship progressively, and, and secondly, you know, caused the, the scattering of the, of the uh, survivors over a large distance. And, and the question you ask, were other ships saved at, in different conditions? The answer is yes, and the na view ships looked at a lot of examples. That Blair showed the uh, Minneap Minneapolis and her slide. Hit basically the exact same place as Indianapolis. Bow severed the same place. But in these other cruisers that were saved, almost all of them were saved, but they were in general quarters when the damage was sustained. And Bue ships, like, uh, like Captain Wren said, they determined, you know, that there was no fault of Indianapolis for cruising in the condition they were in. Um, had they been in a different condition, it might have been saved. Uh, you also need to consider Indianapolis was an older class of cruiser, and they kept piling equipment on her during the war. Admiral Spruance had made a point at one point you know, they kept putting new equipment on. I think the metacentric height was like less than one at this point. And he made the comment, if we get hit in the wrong place, we could just capsize. Um, and it had a bunch of, bunch of portholes, so different type of damage control situation. I uh, always am amused at the old ship uh, story because the ship was 13 years old when it sunk, and mine was 18, when, and it was young. It seemed young at 18 years old when it was decommissioned. So it was an old class, no doubt, it was, you know, a treaty class, Washington treaty class cruiser, but it, it still had a lot of life in her, and, and that has nothing to do with the fact that she sank. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Japanese fleet command is here. <laughs> also the historian. And just the quick note. The Lieutenant Commander Hashimoto, after the war, of, of course, he particip participated in the court martial, and he clearly mentioned even the zigzag. No doubt, he missed. Remember, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah, of course you not. Know, that's his own Mark I fire control system right. here. That's right. Uh, the best and part. also, second, the, it's not really fair to compare the Minneapolis and the Indianapolis. Because Minneapolis was hit by 24 inch long lance torpedo. Yeah. And this one was hit by submarines 21 inch torpedo hit. So, of course, the, you know, the weight of the warhead is very different, mm -hmm. almost twice. Right. You know, submarine torpedo used the Western Standard 21, and the destroyer, they used the 24 inches, long lance. And the firing doctrine depends on the situation, and Hashimoto thought that was the battleship. Yeah. And he fired two sets of three torpedoes. And he, he fired six, and he confirmed at least two hits. And the crew heard the third explosion, but perhaps the explosion of the, the Indianapolis itself. But the, so depending on the, you know, the identification of the class. But basically, the larger ship fire as many torpedoes as possible. But does not necessarily mean at one time. So he you know, divided his six torpedo into two. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thank you Thank very you, much, sir. sir. So remember, he, he fired the two, two the triplets, right? Uh, two degrees separation, three degrees between the two uh, per, uh, triplets. And he describes in great detail in his book, he only needed to get one hit. He still had Kaiten on board. All he needed to do was slow that ship down and it, the Kaiten would have ended it. And so that ship was going down. 
when he found himself coming to periscope depth at absolutely the perfect firing position, that ship was doomed from that moment on. And he also, if you look at his, if you read his accounts, he underestimated the speed of Indianapolis as well. He, he thought she was going 12 knots, which kind of indicates he was anticipating probably a zigzag as, um, as well. So, yeah. and for surface war warriors here, the, your best defense is speed. If Indianapolis had been going faster, the torpedoes would have a hard, would probably run out of fuel before they hit him. Uh, but the reason he wasn't going faster is there was a 16 knot speed limit in place in the Pacific to preserve fuel for the Japanese invasion. So he was stuck between two conflicting orders. He had a 17 knot SOA, which meant he had to zigzag at 23 knots to get to uh, Leyte on time. And he had a 16 knot speed limit. And the, of course, he didn't ask for clarification, which he should have. But it became one of those, what are you gonna do? Well, I'll, I'll obey the speed limit when the weather sucks and I'll follow the speed limit uh, and I'll zigzag when the weather's good. And he did have standing orders, by the way, for the officer of the deck to resume zigzagging if the weather improved. And the officer of the deck didn't do that. The officer of the deck didn't survive. And again, McVeigh did not throw him under the bus. Ned? I just wanted to say for uh, all of you involved with this, uh, it's so wonderful that you were able to shed light on uh, this mystery, but especially for you, Captain Tody, for doing this on behalf of our shipmates. Thank you. Yes, sir. I mean, Spruance used Indianapolis for his flagship basically from the time he took command of 5th Fleet. So that the entire time he was 5th Fleet commander. Um, um, sorry, what was the last part of your question? Did the staff of the 5th Fleet ever make any interviews with them? I haven't looked at... Right, and I, I, haven't, I honestly haven't looked into a lot of the Fifth Fleet staff recollections. I know Flag Allowance, Flag Allowance crew did die in, in the sinking. Um, and Spru Admiral Spruance's family is very involved with the survivors group as well. Yeah, they come to the reunions. Com Commander Hashimoto's granddaughter comes to the reunions every year. Um, it's an incredible experience to see this collection of the, the, the rescuers, and the, most of them are gone now, come to the reunions. But yeah, yeah. Admiral Spruance, the, Admiral, the navigator on Indianapolis who died when the ship went down was Admiral Spruance's navigator. So there's actually parts of the Fifth Fleet staff still on board. Most of them cross-decked after the kamikaze attack. They cross-decked to a battleship, made that their command ship until Indianapolis came back. But Spruance didn't like operating off of a battleship. He liked the cruiser. He liked to get in close. And, and so they were very anxious to get back, and he was devastated by the loss of the ship. Yes, sir. Yes, a lot of information has been presented tonight, but I have a question on the intelligence piece and the intelligence failure or non-failure. And I'm not sure at this point I'm tracking exactly what you said. But it seems to me that those four boxes, including the, what is it, uh, 58, was not shared with Indianapolis. Is that correct? Yeah, yes. So to me, that's an intelligence failure. Even if they had reported that it was gone, if I had been CO, I might have said, well, what if it isn't gone? And isn't it an intelligence failure that they reported it gone when it wasn't? So I, I think there was a contributing intelligence piece. There were other things, as you pointed out, around there. But um, it probably would have been nice to have had that full picture. And it might have spurred the captain and the crew to take a different approach to, to the potential threat. No, and, I, and I'm certainly not arguing against that point. I think, I think you're right. And I, 
my, what I'm just trying to do is present that it's much more complicated than it's been presented in history. It's not, you can't just look at this intelligence picture and say, oh, this is exactly how it was, because that wasn't the reality at the time. So I'm just, it's important to me to piece together everything that was happening in real time. And I agree, I, I say it's not an intelligence failure, but I'm kind of walking a line there. It's, it was an intelligence failure, but not the kind of intelligence failure necessarily that it's been cast as. I mean, in um, Joe Rochefort's oral history after the war with USNI, uh, he, he basically, when asked about Indianapolis, I'm quoting him here, someone goofed is what he said. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly not saying it was, uh, intelligence was perfect, but we need, a, we need to look at all that complexity and talk about it. And Dr. Hulver's correct that the prosecution by the wild hunter of a submarine contact south of the track was included in routine message traffic that the ship did receive, although it, 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 it doesn't sound like the ship's processes were efficient, that these messages were getting to the captain. Um, certainly, even the doctor had that information. It was the doctor joking about the fact that there was a the submarine out there somewhere. What was not shared with him, though, was the, the, the code broken, the fact that we had broken the code and we had more intelligence on the uh, contacts to the north. north yeah. The ones to the south, the Wild Hunter was classified as a cert sub. They even had screw blade information on that submarine. That certainty uh, of contact information was not shared with them. So Dr. Hall was exactly right. It's extremely complicated. But what you have to do in a situation like that is the ops guys get with the intel guys, fuse that data, and say, what's the best thing to do for this ship? None of that was done. Yep. Okay, thank you. And I, just one, one other thing I didn't include, I had scratched out, and I scratched out from my notes, but I think it's important. Also, if you're looking at the dispatches, the most recent submarine threat map, actually Indianapolis left Guam the morning of 28 July. That map left Hawaii and arrived to Guam the morning of 28 July. So there's also... The, the most recent map is not present at Guam when they leave as well either. Okay, I have two more questions that I had before I got up here. I had six, but they've all been answered here. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Blair and also uh, Rich Holver uh, what this all meant to you as far as um, the study of it and, um, and also the impact it had on you after you found out some of the things that you didn't know were, were real. Yeah, yeah, I'll start. Uh, so I'm the granddaughter of three World War II Marines. So for me, it's really important that both our history and our heritage is preserved and saved and we honor um, our service members. Uh, and I'm lucky enough that I get to do that for my job every day. So on a personal note, it was really exciting, it was really cool. Uh, on the, and we were really excited for Richard because it was really his finding of the LST data. Um, NHHC, we did our own survey and then Vulcan um, created their own, but with that, uh, that information is from Richard, so we we're super happy for him. It's really rare for us to find something in the archives and that plays out in real life. Um, and then on the work side, we were surprised. We didn't think anyone was going to find this ship. Uh, and we also knew that that meant our job was just beginning. Shipwreck discoveries have both a positive and negative for us. Positive in the fact that we now know what it is, we can protect it under the Sung Military Craft Act, as is our job, um, but the location is now known. So there is, it is under threat, you know, it can be from disturbance and from looting, so, um, but it's our honor to study it and protect it. Uh, so, so professionally, I think one of the things I learned going into this, I, I wasn't necessarily prepared for how difficult every question about Indianapolis would be. Uh, as a historian writing that history. Everything, almost every part of the story is controversial and disputed, and you have to be prepared to, you know, stand up and really present an argument for this. Everything, everything has question marks, even the number of survivors. I found out when I waded into this, uh, 317 was the number the survivors stood by, the Navy stood by 316, so I had to do the stubby pencil drill and count 1,195, the entire crew roster, and, and compare, and just so, there's been so much, so much work has had to go into every part of this, and that's also personally the most satisfying thing, just helping, just seeing the look on the survivors' faces when they see the wreckage and the closure that brings to survivors and lost at sea families, I mean, that's, that's incredibly rewarding, and being able to go to the survivors' reunion and talk to them about getting the number of survivors correct and getting the numbers of crew on board 
and having them, you know, understand that and buy into it is it's just a very rewarding experience. Okay. I have one more question. In this, uh, in this age of, of individuals uh, in our country and in our government who don't seem to understand accountability, I think tonight is a great example of one man standing up and taking accountability in a situation that was not easy for him to do it because he could look at a lot of ramifications and try to dodge that. And I'd like to ask Captain Toady to comment on the accountability factor of Captain uh, McVeigh and how strong it was. The um, outcome of my research in the 90s as to whether or not you know, McVeigh was guilty, I, I think I made it clear to you, I didn't, I didn't think he was guilty. Let me just say it this way. Um, I didn't think he was culpable. But when it came to the question about was the court-martial not correct in prosecuting him, I diverged from, I think, what the, the survivors wanted me to say, in that a captain of a ship, Navy ship, is fully accountable for everything that happens, whether it was within his control or not. So the accountability has to be there. Once it went to court martial, I probably would have voted to convict based on the broad scope of accountability every one of us has as commanding officer of a Navy ship. My assertion was that the error was made in the decision to go to court martial, that that should never have happened because it served no purpose for the Navy, it served no purpose in lessons learned, uh, it served no purpose for the survivors, certainly. In fact, and one could argue it was counterproductive in the grand scheme. It kept, left, kept a black eye on the Navy for over 50 years until the exoneration um, came through. Um, it was unnecessary. And so uh, the, I think the accountability is there, but as commanders, you have to really think hard about what message is sent and is, is it an appropriate message when you make a decision to do something like this. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think the awards Ch committee chairman would like a few things to say. Please, and thank you. this concludes you. our presentation. I first want to thank you all. And I think you've done a lot to honor the crew, the family, and the uh, honor of Captain McVeigh. And uh, I think from, on behalf of all of the Service Navy Association, we would like to thank you and present you each with a plaque. Again, thank you very much. This uh, concludes this uh, session of Heritage Night. And again, thank you to Raytheon for sponsoring for us. And thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.